Thank you so much, Anita and uh, Shiva. Uh, I, I really uh, appreciate this opportunity to talk to these very bright young girls. And it's really a great, great pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I'll talk about minimal surfaces. Oh, many of you may have heard of the term. But even before, uh, even as child, children, we actually uh, knew minimal surfaces when we were playing with soap films. So soap films are like idealized minimal surfaces. I'll wait a few minutes. And uh, I want to make a distinction. Soap bubbles are a bit different from soap films. Soap bubbles have a different kind of a geometry than soap films. Soap films are like, you know, those uh, uh, soap bubbles are expanding and they burst. And soap films, if you suppose deeper, deeper, uh, uh, supposing you make a wireframe and you dip it in soap solution, some, some surface comes out. That's a soap film. We call that a soap film. And idealized soap films are minimal surfaces. We are here to know the geometry of them. Soap bubbles have a different geometry, which I'll also talk about. So what are minimal surfaces? But before we start, I wanted to say a little bit about topology of compact oriented surfaces and how they are classified by the genus. Have you heard this before, this term genus? How many of you have heard it before? No? Huh? Oh, in biology. No, this is nothing to do with that. I think this is nothing to do with the biology concept. This is, uh, supposing uh, the first example of a surface would come to our mind is the sphere. And this is a sphere, this is a sphere. Uh, the second example, if, if I tell you, can you give me a second example of a surface, you will think of the donut, surface of the donut, right? And there is, there is a fundamental difference between this and this, this ellipsoid, this spheroid and the this kind of spheroids, they all look the same if you topologically deform them. Like you deform them without tearing. You just continuously deform them like plasticine or something. But whereas just by deforming, you obviously cannot get this. You have to tear somewhere and glue, right? So this seems to be fundamentally different from this. And this is the for example. So this is genus 0. This has a genus 1. Genus is the whole, okay? So this, how many genus do you think this has? Three, right? An example is a pretzel. So how are we constructing it? We are constructing the genus as follows. You have the sphere, genus zero. From the sphere, you take out couple of disks, okay? And add a handle. So this is, this is genus 1 and if you deform it, it's homeomorphic to the torus, genus G equals to 1, okay? And so on, you can keep on adding hang handles, these are three handles, I have added, I have removed one, two, two disks here, added a handle. I have removed two disks here, added another handle and so on. Another handle has been added here. So three handles is a genus three surface, like the pretzel, okay? So this is actually homeomorphic to the pretzel. So, uh, so the above figure suggests you can add more and more handles to the sphere, okay? And construct uh, higher and higher genus surfaces, okay? So this is, uh, but then supposing I am given a figure very complicated, like it is in a, I can't tell the genus just like that, okay? Then what, uh, is there a formula which will tell you, which will tell you what the genus is? And this is Euler's famous formula. What you do is you polygonize the surface. So supposing you triangulate the sur sur surface, divided it into 
divided into uh, triangles okay certain number of triangles uh, and uh, then you ca calculate the number of vertices minus number of edges plus the number of faces by faces i mean these these are the faces sorry these are the faces these are the edges and these are the vertices and if you that's the magical formula of euler v minus e plus f is 2 minus 2g so there the genus is coming this is so v minus e plus f is a topological quantity and you see that is an amazing thing because you could triangulate it more or you could polygonize it with squares or something you can do anything you like as long as the faces do not have any holes in it you can polygonize it and you will always get v minus e plus f is 2 minus 2g which is a topological quantity it doesn't change under homeomorphisms right so this is euler's formula so for example for the sphere let's try to calculate that genus is zero so i have triangulated it in three in one two three four triangles there is the bottom most one is a triangle these are the vertices this purple and the yellow forms the, the vertices and there is one triangle here one triangle here one triangle here and that triangle in the bottom so four triangles uh, so that means four faces so let's calculate v minus e plus f for the sphere in this diagram the number of vertices is how much can someone tell me four and number of faces is also four and number of edges is six somebody said six and that's correct it is uh, two and that is by Euler's formula that is 2 minus 2g so genus is equal to 0 so we got it right huh? this is a example of a triangulation of the sphere let's do that to uh, okay so now there are many other polygonization let's say for example the cube cube is topologically equivalent to the torus uh, to the sphere cube is like a sphere in our in our language so if you calculate v minus e plus f again you will get genus z zero similarly the tetrahedron the octahedron dodecahedron icosahedron these are the platonic solids they are all homeomorphic to the sphere and if you calculate v minus e plus f for all of them you will end up getting g is equal to zero okay so if you have the rubik's cube you can do that at home now let's come to the torus so the torus can be thought of as like the thought of made like this what we do is we take a sheet of paper okay identify these two sides like this and then identify these two sides again so so these two sides when i identify i get a cylinder and then I, when I identify these two, I get a torus, okay? And I triangulate it. So basically, this point, so this point, this point, this point come together. Do you agree? These are the two sides. Maybe I'll draw with a colored chalk one of them. These are the two sides I have drawn over there. So this this one and this one corresponds to this green one and the white one corresponds to this over here and which point do you think is the one see you folded this and the, then you fold you folded this and then it came back together these two sides so all the four corners became one point which was that the one over here so that's the one over here, right? Or another way of seeing it is you have the torus, you cut it along this and cut it along this, it will open out like that. Okay, so this one point one goes to these and then I have, I have made these two points, two and two and this is three and three. Okay, and then I have triangulated it like this. Uh, 
I think like this, right? And again, if you calculate how many uh, vertices are there, well, I'll leave it as an exercise. If you calculate, so this you cannot count twice. This 3 is the same as this 3 on the torus. This 2 is the same as this 2 on the torus. But everything else, this is a point 4. This is the point 4, okay? So V minus E plus F, if you count, you will get a 0. So this is 2 minus 2G. So genus G equals to 1, okay? So it has just one hole. That confirms the torus, okay? So I'll leave that, I'll leave that calculation to you. Okay. Please check that any triangle or connected planar figure, the V minus E plus F equals to 1. So this is I'm talking about non-compact. On a non-compact, um, what I mean is not non-compact. I mean on the plane, I have a triangle. What is its V minus E plus F? Just one face is there. Number of vertices cancel the number of edges. So and that is true of any planar figure, agreed? Any planar figure will have the same property, just one face and the number of vertices and number of edges will cancel. Okay, so that is one. Okay, next we come, actually many of these figures with suitable modifications come as minimal surfaces. That's why I'm introducing these. So next is the Mobius strip. The Mobius strip, you take a strip, you twist it and glue it. So it's like a twisted band. And what you notice is it's actually non-orientable because supposing you take a normal to every surface, you can imagine a normal, right? Uh, like the tangent plane is there and there is the normal to the tangent plane. So normal, if you go right round like this, so this is normal, normal, See, the normal which was outside now goes inside and when you come back, it has gone inside. So you couldn't define a normal globally. Locally, you can always define. In this small patch, I could always define a normal. But when I tried to de define it globally, at one point there was two choices, this way or that way. So it wasn't globally defined. So that's non-orientable and it has a boundary. What is the boundary? Can anyone tell me? What is the boundary? Are there two connected components or one connected component? In the boundary, are there two components or one component? One. Just one component. Because you have twisted and glued it. So actually just see, this one goes round like this, like this and comes back. So what is it? In mathematically, what do you, what do you call it? Huh? Huh? It's not helical. Just see, I start from here, go right round, come back like this. It's a circle. The boundary is just one circle. Okay. S1. Okay. The Mobius strip has boundary S1. Okay. Now, that was about topology. So, compact oriented surfaces were um, classified by their genus. And we will be actually interested in a different sort of oriented surfaces, the ones which have some punctures also thrown in. You have some punctures, so they are non-compact in a sense. Uh, no, they are non-compact and in a sense they are, uh, they, I mean for minimal surfaces, we will see they have to be non-compact. So there are some, say the torus with three punctures or a sphere with five punctures. These can be realized as minimal surfaces. We will see a little later. So now we talk about geometry of surfaces. So when we want to talk about lengths of curves on surfaces, area of the surface, Gaussian curvature, mean curvature, then the, it's not enough to have homeomorphisms. You need a little, you need a little more, little subtle structures, subtler structures. And what is that? We need to define 
when we need to define the length of curves, we need something called the metric. Okay, so that we can actually define infinitesimal lengths and integrate it. Okay, so we need the notion of metrics for the area of the surface. Also, we need uh, what is known as the first fundamental form. For Gaussian curvature, we need something called the first fundamental form and the second curvature, the fundamental form. For mean curvature also, we need the first and the second fundamental form. I will talk a little bit about them. I won't go very much into it, but whatever little I need, I will tell you. So, uh, but what you realize is sphere and ellipsoid, which were topologically same or not? Same, topologically, there was a homeomorphism between them, but sphere and ellipsoid are very different geometrically, right? Because one is totally symmetric, the other one has these two diff different uh, axes and so, okay. Now I will talk a little bit about parametrized surfaces in R3. So by that what I mean is, so, so far we have been thinking of just a few surfaces which are like sphere, torus and so on. But what we would also like to do is think of a little piece of a surface as parametrized by an open set. So this is in R3, right? This is in R3, but this surface is parametrized by two parameters u and v in this little patch. That means each point is given by x of uv, y of uv, z of uv. I will call this x of u. So two parameters are characterizing the uh, surface. Okay, you have seen. Have you seen uh, geometry of curves before? So let's first talk about curves before surfaces. So supposing I want to parameterize a curve in R three. How many parameters do I need? How many independent parameters do you think I need to uh, define a curve on a surface? A curve in R3. Two or one? Just one. It's a one dimensional thing in R3. It's just a one dimensional thing. So x of t, y of t, z of t. This t defines the time. I mean, you can. What we usually do is, we take this to be S, where S is, S is the length from a particular point on the curve. So the length is increasing, so it's like that, okay. So S is the arc length from the point P, P0, okay, from P0, okay. We are going to parameterize it by that and this I will denote always by alpha s, okay. Now how would I characterize the tangent vector to the curve? I want to always, whenever I think of a curve, I need to also tell you something about its tangent vector, right? Say you need tangent vector or uh, how would I do that? Just uh, see how do how do I get the tangent vector by limits of differences, right? So I take small parameter parameter different dif differences and I take the differences in the curve uh, and take the limit. So what's happening here? is actually the derivative, first derivative, okay. So at P, so at alpha s, the tangent vector is given by alpha prime s. That means this is my notation for d alpha ds, okay. There is one parameter, so this is d alpha ds. That means in each coordinate, I am taking x prime des, y prime des, z prime des. Got it? 
and the what's special about arc length parameter is alpha prime des alpha prime des inner product is 1 if s is arc length in arc length parameter this tangent vectors are always unit they are moving like this but they are unit length the length of the tangent vectors are unit okay so that's nice but what about the second derivative i want to actually get to the curvature of the how it curves right so for that i need to go to the second derivative i need to see the rate of change of alpha prime itself so right and what you find is the norm of this when it's not zero supposing at a point this is not zero then i define a n hat this is called the normal okay n hat to be supposing at a s this is not zero then i define n hat to be this okay so t hat which was unit length and now i have something called n hat which kind of measures the acceleration the unit acceleration and uh, i'll be able to now define the uh, curvature with this so what one does is second derivative vector the second derivative vector is k s times n vector where k s is plus or minus norm of alpha prime des so i have written something trivial here see n hat was alpha double alpha double prime des divided by its norm right and al therefore alpha double prime des is k s times n hat so it's the norm of this and i assign some sign to it okay and this sign so this is called the curvature this actually measures the curvature of the curve in r3 okay so this this measures the curvature of the curve in r3 and how do i assign the sign so i won't come to that when i come okay i'll tell you how we assign the sign is i just if i take the t hat and n is in this direction say sorry n is supposing in this direction okay if t to n comes out of the board i'll call it plus if t to n t to n goes inside the uh, uh, so t to n if it points inwards then i take k to be plus if points outward then i take k to be minus okay out of the board or in the inside any questions so far i would like a more interactive audience so far understood how to assign the sign to the curvature of the curve this is very important because minimal surfaces uh, for minimal surfaces curvatures of curves are very important so now now i'll go back to my slide for a while and again i'll come to this so that was now we already talked a little bit about parametric surfaces so i want a small little patch of a surface in r3 so supposing it's parameterized by two parameters u and v two parameters are needed because it's two dimensional right two independent degrees of freedom so so for example let's take this this uh, this uh, uh, surface z is equal to tan inverse y by x have any of you seen this before z is equal to tan inverse y by x yeah it's actually a spiral staircase i'll tell you there are various ways of parametrizing it if you put u v tan inverse v by u that's one right i put x as u v, y as v and tan inverse e, e, v by u that's one 
Secondly, you can also take, take it as r cosine theta, r sine theta, theta. So what's happening? If I go x and y round, li round like a circle, what's happening? A helix, because the z is going up, right? So I went go round once to pi, then as soon as I do that, the z coordinate you see is theta. So it has risen by 2 pi. So it's actually a, like a spiral staircase, okay. I have a picture of this. This is, okay. This is the first example of minimal surface I wanted to tell you. So th these are two parameters. Now the third, there is a third parameterization. So if you now complexify u and v, that means you write zeta as u plus i v and zeta bar as u minus i v, then I can write all x and y in terms of this complex parameter and its conjugate, right. And then x of zeta zeta bar is minus half imaginary zeta plus 1 over zeta, y of zeta zeta bar is half real zeta minus 1 over zeta, z of zeta zeta bar minus pi by 2 plus imaginary ln zeta. So this obviously does not tell you anything, I mean obviously you cannot say that this is a helicoid, but if you work it out and eliminate, I mean if you work it out and eliminate zeta, you will get exactly this formula, z is tan inverse y by x, okay. This is actually a helicoid and the representation fails for zeta is equal to 0. Now this kind of uh, uh, formula, what you notice is x is imaginary part of an analytic, when zeta is not equal to 0, this is an analytic function. You have done complex analysis? Huh? No, not yet. Okay, so functions of z and zeta and zeta bar, I will call functions which are only dependent on zeta and not on zeta bar, I will call them as uh, analytic, complex analytic, okay. So if I leave out this imaginary part, what do I have? I have zeta plus 1 over zeta over here, right. Then zeta plus 1 over zeta does not depend on z and z. When I take the imaginary part, of course it will, the dependence on zeta bar will also come. But as you see, this is imaginary part of an analytic function. Similarly, this is real part of an analytic function. Similarly, this is imaginary part of ln zeta which is an analytic function. So what you see is these are real and imaginary parts of analytic functions and they are what are known as harmonic. If when first thing in complex analysis you will learn is real and imaginary part of complex analytic functions are harmonic, okay. Harmonic means uh, say zeta was u plus i v, right. And uh, so let us take only one of the coordinates x is imaginary part of an analytic function. So analytic function satisfies what are known as Cauchy-Riemann uh, equations. Huh? F u is equal to, uh, so this is F1 plus I F2, if I write it like this, this is my F, then F1 u equals to F2 v, F1 v equals to minus F2 v, uh, sorry f1 v is equal to minus f2 u. These are the Cauchy-Riemann equations and if you write it out, if you apply it one more time to f1, you get that the harmonicity of the first real part. If I am making some mistake, please, okay. So basically, I will talk about this as harmonicity of F1 and harmonicity of F2, small exercise you can do. The Cauchy-Riemann operators, the Cauchy-Riemann equations means harmonicity of the real part of a analytic function and imaginary part of an analytic, each individually must be harmonic, okay. And that is what is going on in minimal surfaces. In certain parameterization, the coordinates become harmonic. Okay, now how much time do I have? Half an hour, okay, good, good. 
So, for example, the first thing is the minimal uh, helicoid. Okay, now I'll, I have to tell a little bit about uh, little bit about surfaces that the, how to get the curvatures, right? So, first of all, if you have So, x of u, if I take the first derivatives of each of the coordinates, the first partial derivatives with respect to x, with respect to u, then, so this is basically x u, y u, z u, okay. This is tangential to the surface. This you can believe. There is, it's possible to prove it, but right now let's assume that. So, the tangent plane is generated by they supposing we assume them to be linearly independent so the tangent plane is given by span of so i'll call this uh, tp of s s is my surface okay at the point p not let me call this point p not the tangent plane is the span of these two, okay. So, what is the normal, can someone tell me, this is in R3. So, what is the normal? Huh? Yeah, xu cross xv, but I want to normalize it, just divide by the norm, okay. So, this is the normal, okay. And let's, now let's, uh, now but I want to get to the uh, rate of change of the normal which is going to give me the, how the tangent planes change or rather how the normals to the tangent planes change. That is going to give me the curvature, notion of the curvatures. There are two notions of curvature here. So, so here is my surface, okay, and here is my tangent plane. I take any direction in the tangent plane, V, okay, and it intersects the surface in a curve. So, there is the normal, sorry, what I meant was I have the normal vector to the tangent plane and there is the any direction V I took and there is a plane passing through the V and the normal, uh, V and the normal direction and that will intersect the surface in a curve. Do you agree? Uh, that's called the normal section. The curve is called the normal section. Okay. So let me call this alpha s. I have supposing uh, parameterized it by arc length. Okay. And then at this point p, I calculate its k plus or minus whatever uh, norm of sorry norm of alpha double prime. So, supposing this is the point corresponding to S naught, okay, plus or minus norm of the acceleration vector, okay. So, this and this corresponds to my, so basically I will call this K n of V because I am I am remembering my direction, initial direction I chose because I am going to vary it. So, I am going to call it KNV. Uh, if the curve is curving in this way, it will be positive. If it is curving up, for example, for a saddle, this curve, the KN over here will be negative. And here, for this section, it will be positive. So, for these directions, V, it will be negative, and for these directions, V, V prime it will be positive. I hope I am making it clear. You take any direction on the surface, on the tangent plane, and you make, form the, get the normal section, calculate its curvature, assign the right sign, and that is going to give you, this is called the normal curvature, okay. So, this is called the normal, because it is curvature of the 
it's curvature of the um, um, normal section basically but it depends on a direction v the initial direction we chose so it's going to vary right as you cut if as the plane cuts in different directions the normal sections are going to vary so that's the figure i have here okay so each direction is going to give me a k and v right and now what i do is i take its maximum and the minimum because see this k and v is going to depend continuously on the direction v so in the unit i take a unit direction so it will take its maximum and minimum values on s1 right so because uh, i mean it's compact so it will take its maximum and minimum so let's call it call those two directions e1 and e2 and by theory of surfaces actually this maximum and minimum we had k1 and kn kn e1 is maximum and kn e2 is minimum and e1 is perpendicular to e2 so by theory of surfaces this e1 and e2 are perpendicular okay so i have two unit directions e1 and e2 they are perpendicular to each other and the normal section normal curvature kn e1 and kn e2 this one is maximum this one is minimum okay so the these are called the two principal directions of curvature e1 and e2 and the curvatures themselves the normal curvatures themselves are called principal curvatures okay so there are two special curvatures we call them k1 and k2 product of these two product of these two gives the gaussian curvature and sum of these two give the mean curvature sum of these two by 2 okay the average of these two is the mean curvature so is it clear so far i have just talked about lot of theory and minimal surfaces are one okay i'll skip all this minimal surfaces are one where k1 plus k2 is zero that means they are like saddle likes when k1 and k2 are not identically zero okay k1 and k2 are not zero then k1 at a point p this is all happening at a point p mind you right k1 is not equal to uh, not equal to zero k2 is not equal to zero supposing at some point then k is equal to k1 k2 uh, sorry h is equal to k1 plus k2 equals to zero means k1 is minus k2 okay k1 is minus k2 that means the surface as much as it at that point p as much as, as it is turning up it's turning down at that point so it's a saddle so like a saddle surface which is completely exact like this much is turning as much up as i mean in the sense of curvature k1 is exactly minus k2 so if this curve has k1 p here this one k2 is minus at the point p and this happens at every point so at every point it's a saddle so mean curvature zero surfaces and those points where k1 and k2 are both zero those are called umbilical points if you leave out the umbilical points then minimal surfaces have this interesting property that k1 plus k2 is zero and but caution soap bubbles are not minimal surfaces what do you think the mean curvatures are for soap bubbles they are spheres so are they saddles no right both curve in the same direction and in fact k1 and k2 are both the same and it's one over the radius you should work this out for the sphere the mean curvature is one over the radius of the sphere okay so so now a lot of examples uh, so this is the this is the helicoid this is the catenoid sorry yeah this is the helicoid this is the catenoid this is the nap surface what does it remind you of tips right <laughs> and this is 
these are the shark surfaces. Oops, sorry. These are the shark surfaces. So you can see, and these you have to think of them as continue, continued, like extended in all directions. Okay. So uh, this one is also extended. So this is, uh, and this is the Costa Hoffman mix surface. This is a beautiful surface made out of, actually the topology of this surface is the torus with three punctures. That's the torus with three punctures. So believe it or not, the three punctures have opened out because it has to be a saddle at every point, right? So the three punctures have opened out. So this is one end, this is another end, and this is another end. And they are going like the three punctures have opened out into three ends, and there is genus one over here. Okay. So this is the Costa Hoffman. There is a lot of number theory behind it. This is the Riemann staircase. This is like almost like a flower you have seen, right? This is the Riemann staircase. Then this is the helicoid, but with genus in it. This is helicoid with genus 1, this is helicoid with genus 3. I mean, uh, sorry, not genus 3, this is infinite genus. This is also like every alternate it's skipping a genus. Oh, no, no, still, sorry, this is genus 1. Genus 1 and this is multiple genus. And there's the triply periodic minimal surface. And uh, how much time do I have? 15 minutes, okay. So I'll tell you a little bit about interesting fact. So if you have a wireframe, if you dip it in soap solution, do you expect just one surface to come up or do you expect many or if you're lucky, will you be able to see a more, more than one? Huh? What do you think? Have you ever done this experiment? Do, do you see more than one? If you're lucky, you will be able to see more than one. Okay, so it's not unique. The minimal surface you get out of the uh, soap solution is not unique. And uh, for example, you see, this is the Mobius band, Mobius curve, okay. You have a curve which is twisted. So this is the Mobius band. But, but if you make the curve in a certain way, right, this is the curve, right. If you make the curve a certain way, you see these kind of spanning surfaces. And if you make, make it a little bigger, then you see this kind of surfaces. They are actually energy minimizing, right? They are saddle points of an energy functional. They are energy minimizing. But the point is, they are stationary points of the energy functional. So supposing I have this situation. I have a function some parameters say lambda, and this is a function of lambda. I am looking at these stationary points, the concave ones, concave up ones, okay. So here there is a stationary point, here there is an even deeper stationary point, but if you are lucky, you, could, you so the minimal surface 1 is sitting here, the minimal surface 2 is sitting here, 3 is sitting here. If you have enough energy in your system, you might be lucky enough to see this. Okay. Most probably you will see only the one which has very low energy, but because these are all energy minimizing. Energy minimizing gives you mean curvature 0. So, but... Uh, I shouldn't say minimizing, it's not exactly right. I should say stationary points of the area functional. I mean, technically it's not right to say minimizing, but uh, they are stationary points of the energy functional. And uh, so you may be able to see a few, few other minimal surfaces. Okay, so I'll skip all the details, harmonicity of the coordinates, Weistas and Epa, this is a lot of mathematics. But I'll just come to the last bit of my talk. So there is 200 year old mathematics behind it, by the way. 200 and even more, 250 year old mathematics. People have been studying minimal surfaces and they still they pound surprises on us. Okay. 
so for example, I'll give you this example. Uh, this is a beautiful example of a helicoid and a catenoid being connected by a series of minimal surfaces. They are all minimal and what happens is they are also what are known as isometric. So basically lengths on this go to, there is a map between all of them, you can map this one to this one, this one to this one and so on and the lengths remain the same throughout. So the helicoid which looks very different and geometrically they are very different, you see, uh, sorry, topologically they are very different but geometrically they are same in a sense, they are isometric, lengths and so on are the same, first fundamental form is the same. Second fundamental form of course is different but at least to some extent the geometry of this and the geometry of the catenoid are the same even though you may have to, you can't see it, what is happening is a tearing you can see, right? A tearing is happening. So topologically of course they are not the same but this is one example. And what do you think is the topology of this? What do you think? Can you guess? Someone guess? What is the topology of the catenoid? What is the topology of a cylinder? Eh? No, not the rectangle. It's not rectangle. What did you say? No. Donut you had to close it up, remember? So sphere with, it's not the sphere, with two punctures. So if you have a sphere and you make two punctures, you can believe, you can topologically deform, like homeomorphically deform it to a cylinder, right? Agreed. The punctures go there and then you can imagine a map into the catenoid, okay? So topologically it's sphere with two punctures. Yeah, one puncture becomes a disc, no, one puncture doesn't, yeah, one puncture becomes a disc and that is also a minimal surface uh, with a boundary, just the plane, the plane is a minimal surface, K1 plus K2 is obviously zero because K1 is zero, K2 is zero. Okay, so plane, uh, yeah, so if you have one puncture that's a disc, it's a minimal surface, two, sphere with two punctures can be realized as a minimal surface. There's a theorem that any genus surface with any number of punctures, any genus surface with any number of punctures can be realized as a minimal surface. Okay, these are very deep theorems, but as I told you, this is 250 year old subject so people have. So basically it's a matter of trying to immerse this into R3 minimal with minimal uh, um, what I mean is uh, such that K1 plus K2 is zero at every point, okay? But there is a lot of theory behind it which makes things much easier. And one last thing I'll say, can I say one last small thing? So uh, okay. So this side, one last small thing I will say and I will stop there. Supposing you have Z is equal to, this is X, Y, Z, not U, U plus IV, okay? This is X, Y, Z. Supposing you have this surface, tan inverse tan H Y cot X. So this is Z as a function of X and Y. This gives one minimal surface that is this surface over here, okay? It has a complicated form but this can be derived that Z is equal to tan inverse tan H, tan H Y cot X is that red surface. And we have the helicoid, right? So now what can, <laughs> sorry. Supposing Z is equal to tan inverse Y by X. What kind of a surface is this? We saw this first helicoid, right? And what are these? What do you think is happening to these? Uh, supposing I put Z is equal to tan inverse Y by X plus K pi. Don't look at the bottom of the thing. I have written it already. But don't look at, supposing you just take Z is equal to tan inverse 
y by x plus k pi. What's happening? k is an integer. It's shifted, right? Shifted in towards the left or the right? Yes, right. To the left. But k I'm taking positive and negative. <laughs> so these are like shifted helicoids and you put them in an array like this. Shifted helicoids, you put them in an array and add it. So this way also it's going towards infinity, this way also it's going to. Like, you know, both sides infinite sum if you do, then what you get is this minimal surface. And this is very amazing because minimal surfaces, the height functions, this is the height function of a helicoid, this is the height function of that thing and it doesn't actually add up because actually there is a very nonlinear equation it, they satisfy, okay. So they do not add up but in this case, this is Ramanujan's identity and somehow it is tantalizingly uh, that uh, infinite sum of shifted helicoids should add up to this other surface. This is one of the identities of Ramanujan. So a lot of, uh, lot of interesting number theory is also hidden in the surface of minimal surfaces and uh, number theory comes in many ways and uh, also analysis, very hardcore analysis comes, geometry of course. So it's a very nice subject but it's not easy to do any original work in this because you know it is very beaten track. So people also do some generalizations called maximal surfaces but I won't go into that. So I will give you some, uh, I will give you some references. So this one is a great book, David Lovett, Demonstrating Science with Soap Films. Then Awesomeman, DRK Syndrome, these are standard books, Nietzsche, uh, they are all very standard books on minimal surfaces. The Ramanujan identity I showed was from Ramanujan's notebook. Then the maximal surface story comes, there is a very nice review article, Differential Geometry of Curves and Surfaces in Lorenz Minkowski Space. There are a lot of new things analogous to minimal surface theory can be done. And me and my collaborators also have written a lot of papers on minimal and maximal surfaces. So anyway, if you need any more references or if you are very curious about this, I can tell you more about this. But right now I'll stop here.